I think what we're going to have to do, I think really what we're going to have to do Two. is, I'm not sitting I'm talking about when I lecture, I was going over to the admin building and the Lincoln's giving a lecture outside the president's office. I mean, I'm serious. I'm serious. So I should have to be spending YouTube out to do it. I should not have to do it. I'm paying to give the opinion in this building. So, it's coming. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of pancreas stuff. Remember the next week here, you guys are going to get inundated with diabetes. And so, um, so here we go. Um, the objectives for today, we're going to talk about the embryology, how things got to where they are, some of the histology, some of the cell biology, uh, protein synthesis, what's involved in that, and then... Um, how these uh, hormones and enzymes that are released by the endocrine and exocrine pancreas uh, play into the system. By starting off about five weeks after conception, it, this is what you look like, and this is we've seen from anatomy a thousand times since then. We have the um, folded embryo, and the foregut is right here, from everything from here up, the mid gut, and then the hind gut. The pancreas, I can tell you right now, is going to develop from the foregut. If you'll notice uh, here, uh, in this slide, in the fifth week, you have coming off of the uh, gut tube a dorsal pancreatic bud. A dorsal pancreatic bud that develops posteriorly or in the dorsal direction into the dorsal mesenchyme. Now, if you look at this structure here, this is uh, what's going to become the bile duct. Okay, you can see the, the gallbladder developing as a diverticulum off of that. So from the gut tube, between the gut tube and the gallbladder diverticulum, they're going to develop a short time later, a few days later, a ventral pancreatic bud. So here's the dorsal bud up here. There's the gall bag diverticulum. <laughs> and between it and the gut tube is a ventral pancreatic diverticulum. Now, I keep saying diverticulum. Remember, these things are uh, outpouchings of the gut tube. Therefore, I can tell you right now, the pancreas, all of the pancreas, in terms of the functional portions, the islets and the excrement pancreas, are endodermal in origin. They're endodermal in origin because they develop as a diverticulum off of the epithelium of the gut tube. And understand there's a difference between endoderm, well, there's not a difference, they're the same thing. The endoderm derivative of the gut tube and the epithelial lining of the gut tube, it's the same thing. So, uh, not many uh, days later, you get these, uh, and these things develop just like any other uh, type of glandular structure. You'll have a single thing, uh, diverticular growing out, and it'll bifurcate into two, and then those two will bifurcate again, and again, and again, and again, and again, until you get a duct system, and at the end of the duct, you'll have an acinus of cells. So the acinus will be like a cul-de-sac we've described before for the lungs in particular. Now, um, remember that the gut uh, in the first trimester is elongates. So you've got 30-something feet of gut, and it grows out into the yolk sac. And then at some point, it starts to pull back in. And then as it pulls in, remember that the intestines rotates. It rotates initially 90 degrees and then another 180 degrees to total 270 degrees. And as it rotates, what was the stomach sitting right here in the anterior posterior plane now gets rotated so that it's, it lies in the adult position uh, more in a horizontal plane with a ventral mesentery giving rise to the greater momentum and the dorsal mesentery 
being contiguous with the liver as the lesser omentum. Remember that from anatomy. Now, as the, um, as the uh, intestines, uh, as the intestines starts to pull back in and rotate, what happens is, if this is the dorsal pancreatic gut, here's the ventral, the, sh the smaller ventral pancreatic gut, it rotates like that and, and actually comes juxtaposed to the dorsal pancreatic gut. So the, door, so the ventral rotates around to join the bottom part of the, um, the dorsal. So here it is rotating around, you know, around, bam. And so that's what it looks like. That would be the ventral pancreatic bud, and that's the much larger dorsal pancreatic bud. And these two fuse, and when they fuse, this right here forms the uncinate process. So the uncinate process of the pancreas is derived from the ventral pancreatic bud. What large artery and vein runs between those two? Superior mesenteric artery and vein run between those two. And they run between them because they got caught up in them as it was rotating around. Now, the duct system does something different, too. You can see that you initially start out with an opening into the gut tube, one on the ventral side, one on the dorsal side. But when these things are wrapped around and joined, what happened is the duct, the main pancreatic duct, actually became fused with the duct in the ventral pancreatic bud so that the main opening of the pancreatic duct, it's an antler of water, the antler of water is down here. So the main pancreatic duct drains to the tail, the body of the pancreas, and the uncinate process. This thing used to come all the way across, but what happened was this became smaller up here as the accessory pancreatic duct and only drains the head. But understand that embryologically, this is the dorsal pancreatic bud up here, and it used to drain out what is in the adult, the accessory opening. But because these things uh, fused and took that little S turn, now the main pancreatic duct is draining out the hole that started out as the ventral pancreatic bud. If you listen to that on the video five or six hundred more times, <laughs> you'll understand what I just said. They just swapped position, essentially. So the, so the trick is, the main pancreatic duct, or the singular code, will always be distal in the duodenum than the accessory pancreatic gut. And because this thing, the ventral pancreatic gut developed off of the bile duct, that's why they join, that's why the bile duct joins the pancreatic duct to empty as one unit. That's why the relationship is there, because it developed from it. Okay? I mean, if you stop to think about it, this accessory pancreatic duct up here used to be what was going to be the bowel duct. It used to be this thing right here. But because it joined up with the uncinate process duct, the transfer position, it just got all screwed up. But that's the way it is. Alright, now, so as this diverticulum grows out, here's the diverticulum right here growing out. 
These are the epithelial cells that line the duct of the pancreas. Remember that the epithelial cells are endodermal in origin. If you see, look right there, it'll say endoderm. At certain points along the way, as this thing uh, starts to elongate, you'll get these clusters of cells like this. Clustering of cells. They are all endodermally derived clustering of cells. These things grow larger and larger off of here. And next thing you know, they pop off as discrete balls. These are the islets of Langhorns. They essentially bud off of the developing ducts. So the islets of Langerhans are endodermally derived as well. This is going to be the exocrine pancreas. That's the endocrine pancreas. And as they, uh, I should say that if you take the bud right here, it's more like a sheet. Well, the sheet folds on itself like that to form a ball. And as it does so, it takes capillaries with it. So within the islet, you have this huge capillary network surrounding these uh, endocrine cells. And this is what histologically a pancreas looks like. When you stain a pancreas, uh, the darker red, reddish color here, reddish and blue color, is the exocrine pancreas. And what you're looking at here on a higher magnification, you see the little asinine. You see here the duct right there, pancreatic duct. You see that one right there with a little hole in the middle? That one right there with a little white clear hole in the middle? That's the acinus. That's like the cul-de-sac. So the exocrine juices that come out of these cells are going to empty into that little hole, which is continuous with the pancreatic duct. Eventually it's going to drain, make its way to the main pancreatic duct. Scattered out in there are these nice balls. Uh, these are the islets. These are the islets of uh, Langerhans. Now, it says right here, up here, that they contain four cell types. They actually contain five cell types. And you know the most uh, prominent cell type is going to be the beta cell. That makes up 70% of the cells of an islet. The beta cells are concentrated in the core. Alpha cells are glucagon secreting cells. They are concentrated around the periphery. And there's about, uh, if it's 70% uh, beta <coughs> cells, maybe 20% glucagon or alpha cells. Then there's a delta cell, and that's about 5%, up to about 5%. The delta cells are also scattered around the periphery. They secrete somatostatin. And I'll talk about these hormones in a minute. And then the final um, endocrine cell, really, is uh, the PP cell, pancreatic polypeptide cell. The fifth cell is um, called the epsilon cell. And there's less than 1% of those, again, around the periphery. And that secretes a hormone called ghrelin. You'll see it in another slide. G-H-R-E-L-I-N. Ghrelin. I'll tell you what it's called in a minute. Here's a big vein over here. You can see the size of these cells. You see the vein is full of red blood cells? A red blood cell is 7 microns in diameter. Look how tiny these are compared to these big, fat, juicy uh, islet cells. An islet, if you uh, put pancreas into collagenase that dissolves the collagen that's in the inner space here. The scaffolding of the pancreas that supports the glandular structure is collagen. So if you digest away the collagen, you can actually get the islets to float away and you can identify them uh, pretty readily with just a dissecting microscope. You don't even, you can almost do it with the unaided eye. They're not microscopic, they're big enough to see. 
Okay? And because they have this little um, capsule around them of connective tissue, they stay intact. And that capsule is not a true basement membrane, it's just connective tissue. Let's talk for a second about the exocrine pancreas. Um, think of the exocrine pancreas as uh, having two roles. One is it, one role is that it pours out water and bicarb for the purpose of uh, diluting the acid, um, the acidity of the, the bolus of food that's just dumped into the duodenum. The hormone that causes the release of water and uh, bicarb is uh, secrete. When that food bolus empties out of the stomach into the duodenal bulb, it causes the duodenal cells to secrete secrete, and that's what pumps out, causes the exocrine pancreas to pump out. The other hormone that's released by the duodenum is cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin, you see all these enzymes up here at the top? Cholecystokinin induces the exocrine pancreas to dump out enzymes. So if I ask you what hormone would be responsible for chymotrypsinogen release from the exocrine pancreas, you would say, well, that's cholecystokinin. Okay? If I said what hormone caused an increase in the bicarb, you would say it's secretin. Now, there are two other enzymes up here that are important, uh, lipase and amylase. Lipase is, a, um, is an enzyme found <coughs> in several different body uh, tissues, from endothelium to endothelium, <coughs> most of them in the pancreas. So the function of lipase is to break down um, complex uh, fats into free fatty acids, uh, glycerol, that type of stuff that you can actually absorb lipase. The other one is amylase. Amylase breaks down starch into simple sugars. And you have a ton of amylase in your salivary glands and in your pancreas, your exocrine pancreas. Those are the two <coughs> dominant places where you're going to see amylase. If you have a small rise in serum amylase, you might think of sialoadenitis. Sialoadenitis. I think I may have mentioned this in anatomy. Your uh, inflammation of the salivary glands. A large increase in amylase would indicate something bigger in your <coughs> salivary glands, probably the pancreas. And in fact, you use these two uh, to, to measure uh, pancreatic injury. In acute pancreatitis, what you have is inflammation of the pancreas as a result of alcoholism or a virus or whatever other cause, it breaks down the cells of the exocrine pancreas and releases these enzymes into the tissue and into the serum. You measure, if you have somebody suspected of acute pancreatitis, you measure amylase and lipase. All right? Understand this, that if these cells, so ordinarily these enzymes are going to be released into the duct. But if there is tissue destruction and, they, and they, these enzymes are released into the surrounding tissues, what do you think is going to happen to the surrounding tissues? They're going to start breaking down the surrounding tissues. That's one of the problems with acute pancreatitis your pancreas starts digesting itself. Anyway, you measure uh, pancreatitis, or if you have somebody suspected of upper, uh, upper abdominal pain, uh, especially a drinker, um, then you want to get a lipase and amylase. There are a couple of differences here. If they rise greater than three times, you should suspect um, uh, acute pancreatitis, which is what AP stands for right there. Amylase uh, is uh, not the best marker because it rises so fast and goes away so fast. The better marker for acute pancreatitis is lipase. Although most of the time when you are doing this uh, investigation in somebody, you're going to order both of them, amylase and lipase. 
But understand, read this carefully. Uh, you may see this in multiple choice format later on, that lipase uh, is the better uh, uh, enzyme to measure for these reasons right here. Okay. Understand that they are not pancreatic function enzymes. It's not like measuring creatinine with the, with the kidneys. That tells you about kidney function. This is not pancreatic function. This is the number of pancreatic cells that are breaking down. It says right here that sometimes you can correlate the degree of the severity of acute pancreatitis to the rise in these enzymes. It's not always precise because, again, there's a time, there's a peak and a, and a uh, half life of these things. So you can't use it reliably. But you can say that uh, if there is a monstrous increase in amylase and lipase, you've probably got a monstrous case of uh, acute pancreatitis. And I think maybe in anatomy, uh, I talked about a thing called Ransom's criteria. Did I talk about Ransom's criteria? Do you remember Ransom's criteria? R-A-N-S-O-N-S. You guys got to remember everything I ever say. You have to remember it. Okay, shall we? Okay, so Ransom's, <laughs> Ransom's criteria, when a patient presents with a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, you measure certain things, like do they have a fever? What's the, what, how high is their white count? How high is their blood sugar? Because that's what they pancreas. How high is their, are their enzymes? You take these features and you add them up to get a score. If your score is 7 out of 7, then you have a 100% chance of dying in the next 48 hours of acute pancreatitis. So the rise of this, these enzymes are relevant uh, when you're talking about acute pancreatitis. Now, because these enzymes uh, uh, dissolve or digest everything in their path, what you wind up with are two signs that you need to know and remember forever because they're definitely board questions. Cullen sign and great Turner sign. Some people just call it Turner sign. What happens here is because most of the pancreas is retroperitoneal. Most of the pancreas is retroperitoneal. The only part that's intraperitoneal is at the head of the pancreas where it joins the body. Most of the body and the tail are retroperitoneal. So if there's bleeding coming out of the pancreas from it digesting itself, it's going to get into the, that fascial plane and can track around to form these big echomotic bruises. Cullen sign is in the infra um, umbilical area. Gray Turner sign is in the flanks. Here it's like right here. These are not good signs. And these are not early signs. These are late signs of acute pancreatitis. Two signs you should never forget, Cullen's and Great Turner. All right, let's talk about the islands. There are about a million of them in your, um, in your pancreas, in the adult human pancreas, uh, about a million. Uh, there are about 100 microns across, uh, minimally, as it says right here. If you weighed them all, they would weigh the weight of a dollar bill. A dollar bill weighs a gram. So one to one and a half grams how much those million islets weigh. That's not very much. What's interesting about that is that if you look at the pancreatic, the whole, the pancreas as a whole, the islets take up very little percent of the pancreas weight, yet they pick up 10% of the blood flow through the pancreas. Well, is that very surprising? No, oh, because the islets are endocrine. Where did the endocrine cells release their blood, uh, product? Into the circulation. Where does the exocrine pancreas release its product? Into the duct. Where does the product of the exocrine pancreas go? To the duodenum. Where does the product of the endocrine pancreas go? Where? where? Which goes to where? The liver. The product of the endocrine pancreas goes to the liver. In a minute, we're going to talk about glycogen. That's the target, the, one of the biggest targets 
of insulin and uh, glucagon is the liver. Right. Uh, here's the details of the islet. This is called immunocytochemistry here. What they do is they make antibodies to these different proteins and then they tag the antibodies so you can see them. Here are all the beta cells in the middle. Those are the uh, blood vessels, uh, capillaries in the islets. And you see the alpha and delta cells scattered around the periphery. At the electron microscopic level, they also look different. You can't tell, if you just look at an islet, you can't tell one cell type from another at the light level. At the electron microscopic level, you can tell because the beta cells, the granules look like the eyes of goats. To me, they look like the eyes of goats. The alpha cells have a uh, dense core or a more dense core uh, in a more lighter uh, rest of the granule. And the somatostatin cells have just a, a uniform uh, sort of light gray color. So you can look at the, at the electron microscopic level, you can look at these and identify which cell type you're looking at. They don't look like goat size to you? <laughs> no. I just looked them up. Did <laughs> <laughs> you look up goat size? See, they look like goat size. Don't they look like goat size? Okay. All right, so here are the five uh, types of cells and uh, what they do. Um, dense core vesicles is how they describe that, not goat size vesicles. The role of insulin, you know, is it will decrease um, uh, plasma glucose. Where it goes is into glycogen in the liver or into glycogen in the, the muscle or into fat in adipose cells. This is listed somewhere else later on, so you don't have to write that down. Alpha cells uh, or glucagon, uh, once it gets to the liver, its role is basically to convert glycogen to glucose uh, and dumps it into the circulation. So if you've taken, uh, if, if Ron comes in in uh, comatose, one of the first things you're going to do when you deal with comatose patient is get a blood sugar level, finish the blood sugar. If his blood sugar is 22, then the first treatment, if he's comatose, that I'm going to do to him is I'm going to give him glucose. IV glucagon will dump the glucose or it will convert glycogen to glucose and it does so rapidly out of his liver to raise his blood sugar. Okay? Glycogen, if you're talking about, uh, you know, like these marathon runners and stuff like that, <coughs> glycogen is, your, is a storage uh, for glucose. And once you start running, it doesn't take you very long before you use up, your skeletal muscle uses up your blood sugar and starts pulling sugar in from other sources. That would be the glycogen that you have stored in your liver and the glycogen that you have stored in your skeletal muscle. However, it's not going to take you many miles to burn that up. Then you have to start looking for another source of glycogen. Uh, sugar, and that's either going to be from the stuff you eat along the way, or you're going to start burning fats. When you start burning fats for energy, what do you produce? Ketones. Right? So that's why these marathoners, they are acidotic by the time they finish a marathon. Okay? That's all very simple. Okay. Uh, these uh, somatostatin cells, somatostatin decreases the release of insulin and glucagon. It has a negative uh, uh, <coughs> feedback uh, control over the alpha and uh, beta cells. Pancreatic polypeptide is, uh, has sort of a paracrine effect and that it regulates, it says, pancreatic secretions from the exocrine pancreatic cell. And the epsilon cells are kind of cool because ghrelin which is what they secrete, has an effect on somatostatin, which has an effect on um, insulin and glucagon. Relin also has an effect centrally to suppress 
it's to activate your satiety centers. Okay, I'm full. I've done eating. I'm done eating calories. I'm done. Okay? It also slows emptying from the stomach, so that it prolongs. It helps prevent acute spikes in blood sugar. Really does. Okay. And that's the physiology. We're done. See you. Not quite. All right. If you look at the islets, uh, their, their uh, capillary structure, we talked about the, the products getting into the circulation. It's through fenestrated capillaries. It's through the capillaries within the islets are very fenestrated. The capillaries within the exocrine pancreas are not. You, you don't want them to be. Those products are not going into the circulation. Now, these cells that are in the islets, well, actually, all throughout the pancreas, exocrine or endocrine, are very characteristic of protein synthesizing cells. Insulin's a protein, glucagon's a protein, somatostatin's a peptide, they're all amino acid based. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to go over some of the properties of protein synthesizing cells. And I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail here. But just kind of make sure everybody understands the process of cellular structure and transcription and translation. And you've probably had it all a thousand times, but this is going to be a superficial review. First of all, almost every organelle in your cells, within your cells, almost everyone, not all of them, almost everyone, including your cell membrane, is composed of a phospholipid bilayer. It's a phosphate group and then a uh, fatty acid chain on the, on the inside. So you've got hydrophobic outsides and hydro, excuse me, hydrophilic outsides, hydrophobic insides. Everything is made of these phospholipid bilayers. The one thing that's not made that's, that's common is uh, they're called microsomes. Microsomes contain uh, hydrogen peroxide. And they're used to digest things. And the only reason I bring it, bring them up, they have nothing to do with today's discussion. The only reason I bring them up is because they do have something to do with thyroid disease. So when I talk about thyroid disease later on, we actually produce antibodies to these microsomes. Uh, that those don't have a lipid bilayer, phospholipid bilayer. It's just one single phospholipid. So when we're talking about insulin granules, you know the goat's eyes, that's what they look like right there. They're surrounded by this phospholipid bilayer. Why are they surrounded by the phospholipid bilayer? Because when the contents of this are going to get dumped out into the circulation, this has to fuse with that. It fuses with it. And if it's identical in structure to it, there's no change that has to happen. It just fuses with it. The two layers just uh, join and move on apart. Excellent. All right. Um, it feels, uh, let's see, embedded within the phospholipids are going to be all sorts of um, protein and glycoprotein receptors that you see uh, here. They're not only embedded in it, there's some that are stuck to the outside, there's some that are stuck to the inside, uh, there's some that are globular, form canals, like calcium channels that are involved in cystic fibrosis. There are others that are formed little cork screws, like a wine screw going through there. Uh, these would be like glucose transporter type proteins. Uh, so when you stop and think about this, you know, you've got this nice uh, layer of phospholipids. And these uh, proteins that are stuck in, how dense are those proteins? If you had a cell, the surface of the cell was this big, the apical surface of the cell, how many proteins are you talking about receptor wise? How many are on the surface? Are there like four? Are there eight? How many receptors does a cell have on its surface? Good God, look at this. That's how many. This is what's called a freeze fracture technique. They freeze the cell and then hit it with a knife, and as the tissue split, some of those lipid bilayers pull up and some pull down. So what you're doing is you're fracturing the phospholipid bilayer right in the middle, and you're getting the bumps 
from all these proteins. So if you look at the surface of the cell, 80% of the surface of the cell has a receptor on it, has some type of receptor on it, which I think is fascinating. The reason I want to bring it up is because when you're talking about uh, like HIV having a receptor for certain things, you know, like T helper cells in your nervous system. Look how many receptors are on a cell. It's amazing. That's just fascinating to me. Okay? Any questions about the membrane itself? All right, next we'll go to the nucleus, the nuclear parts to the nucleus. You got the nucleolus is here. You've got euchromatin, which is the strands of chromosomes that are unwound. Um, <coughs> and because they're unwound, they can be read, uh, transcribed. If they're bunched up, knotted up into heterochromatin, you can't really um, uh, transcribe heterochromatin. It has to be um, uh, elongated or unwound as euchromatin. If we were to look at this uh, membrane of the nucleus. Again, it's a phospholipid bilayer. You would see that there are holes in the nucleus. Those holes in the nucleus allow for certain things to exit, mainly a, 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 a lot of nucleic acid called messenger mRNA. We'll talk about that in a second. Messenger RNA will leave the nucleus to enter the rough endoplasmic reticulum which is outside the nucleus. This is a high power magnification of the RER. And the reason it's called RER is because you have ribosomes uh, stuck to it. Ribosomes are made of RNA. R, RNA. Ribosomal RNA. The ribosomes that are stuck to this thing translate the messenger RNA into the cistern of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Should I say that again? Everybody got it. This is, say it again. Ribosomes that are attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and it's called rough because the ribosomes are attached to it, translate the messenger RNA into the cistern of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. In other words, DNA codes for proteins, peptides and proteins, period. DNA does not manufacture carbohydrates or fats. It only makes peptides and proteins. So at this level here, the message from DNA is being translated into a peptide or protein which funnels itself into the cistern of the RER. Rough endoplasmic, endoplasmic reticulum is just like a sack of flattened sacks. That didn't make any sense. A stack of flattened sacks. So what we're going to do is we're going we're to pour the protein and as we build it, we're going to extrude it into the inside of the sac. And as the proteins start building up on the inside of the sac, they actually make the sac puffy. You see right there? You see where that's puffy right there? It's flat right there. Puffy right there. There's a whole bunch of protein right there. Now, so you have, if we take a bunch of home, homeland bags, we've got them stacked up here. That's our RER. And you've got all of this protein inside the homeland bag. The protein starts making its way. All these uh, cisterns are connected. All the bags are connected. The protein starts making its way to the, to the top bag. And then will bud off as a, um, as a little uh, vessel. <laughs> A transfer vesicle. A transfer <coughs> vesicle. Here's our nucleus. Oh look, there's a pore. Wow, that was I could have driven a Buick into that mouth. <laughs> <laughs> she gone so wide you could hear 
jaw unhinged. <laughs> All right, so here we have the proteins being made. Here are the transfer vesicles. They float up and join the back side of another stack of flattened sacs called the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus has two faces. It has a cis face, a C-I-S face. It's also called the forming face. These membranes will fuse to that, the forming face, dump their contents into the Golgi, and as the contents make their way towards the top of the Golgi, they bud off as secretory granules from the trans face, also called the mature face of the Golgi. So right here you have secretory granules containing insulin, glucagon, somatostatin, PP, or uh, ghrelin, or chymotrypsinogen, or anything you can name. When called upon to do so, they will fuse with a uh, membrane. Remember, these are, these are uh, phospholipid bilayers too. They fuse with the membrane and dump their contents either into the duct or to the bloodstream. That's how it works. You know, the, the interesting thing is, none of this was known until the electron microscope was invented in the 1950s. So it wasn't until about the mid-70s that they actually figure out how proteins within a cell were made in a script. That's amazing. That's not that long ago. I mean, also, we stop thinking about it. The synapse between two neurons, they didn't know until the 1950s that neurons were not one continuous thing, that there was a gap between neurons. They didn't even know that. Nobody knew that until the 1950s. Isn't that impressive? That's only 70 years ago. Wow. All right. Let's talk about uh, uh, a couple of things here, and then we'll take a break. Transcription is taking the genetic code, the DNA, and creating a messenger RNA of the gene. So when you look at DNA, you have purines and pyrimidines. Those are your four bases. You have two of each. And they're listed here and how they bind to each other. Most folks will have 22 chromosomes plus an XX or an XY for a total of 23 chromosome pairs. And although you have 3.2 trillion base pairs, only 5% of it is functional. The rest of it is nonsense. Which is interesting, when you're talking about a chimpanzee shares 95% of the chromosomes make up of us. They're not really talking about that. They're talking about that. That's interesting. I mean, it's even interesting to me that only that little bit of a difference can make the difference between Nathan and Andrew. It's amazing. This is, uh, you remember the uh, Watson and Crick were the ones that back in the 50s, I think it was the 50s, they figured out, maybe the 60s, they figured out the structure of DNA. Now people knew about DNA. They knew that it was a genetic material. They just didn't know the structure. Watson and Crick, when you talk about they discovered DNA. No, they did not discover DNA. They discovered the structure of DNA as a double helix structure. And if you look at the base pairing, why adenine uh, will bind with thymine, and guanosine and cytosine are together, is because two of them have double hydrogen bonds. The other two have triple hydrogen bonds. So they can't mix up. They can only bind in this way, A and T, C and G. Now, 
when you're going to transcribe something, a, uh, an enzyme called RNA polymerase is one of the enzymes involved here. There's another enzyme that un unzips the DNA, and there's another enzyme that zips it back up, but RNA polymerase is the one that creates the messenger RNA. Now, when you unzip or unwind a chromosome, understand that the gene is only on one side. The base pairing that will produce the protein is only on one side. The other side is nonsense. It doesn't produce any functional protein. It's called the missense strand. Some people call it the nonsense strand. It's the, that does not contain the gene. Only one side contains the gene. And the base pairing for RNA is the same as it is for DNA, with the exception of U being substituted, I mean T being substituted by U. Right? And here we go here. Now this is an interesting point here. You build RNA, and you see that they're they're built, it's built just by the base pairing here. And it would be opposite, so that the messenger RNA is essentially the missense strand. You understand? The messenger RNA is essentially the same base pairing as the missense, with the exception of U and T. Otherwise, it's the same. Here's a funny thing, or an interesting thing. Transcription occurs at a rate of about 40 base pairs a second. The insulin that's initially made is 330 base pairs long. So that means it takes just a little more than 8 seconds to make one insulin molecule, to transcribe for one insulin molecule. It takes longer than eight seconds to make it because you got to get through the RIR and Goji. But to transcribe an insulin molecule takes a little bit more than eight seconds. 8.25 if you sit here and calculate it out. Right. Again, the two other forms of RNA would be the <coughs> ribosomal RNA that we're talking about. And by the way, ribosomal RNA in a human a ribosome is made up of two subunits. There's an alpha and a beta subunit. If you take these uh, things and you split them in half and put them in what's called an ultra centrifuge, the centrifuge is at you know, tens of thousands of uh, revolutions per minute. These things will uh, centrifuge out at different levels. The leveling, there's, there's a unit of measure for the leveling. They're called Spedberg units. Spedberg units. Something like that. FV. Spedberg units. This levels out at 40, and that's 60. Spedberg units. So that's the weight for the, and the three-dimensional structure gives you uh, that. There are classes of antibiotics that work by binding to ribosomes of bacteria. If you look at the ribosomes of bacteria, they're very similar to a humans. They're different enough so that when you take Zithromax, it binds to the 30S subunit of a bacterium. You don't have a 30S subunit. That's why it doesn't kill you. Okay? That's kind of interesting. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about today, but you know, 
that Jeopardy thing is, did you know that there was a PA from Oklahoma on Jeopardy? She did pretty well. So all these years I've been saying, if you're on Jeopardy, somebody actually did go on Jeopardy. <laughs> did you teach her? Huh? Did you teach her? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I knew she was going to be on because it was on Facebook. And so sure enough, like, I think she came in second place. It won like fifteen thousand dollars. So I mean, she wasn't. She, she did us proud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take a break, and then we'll come back and talk about. <laughs> <laughs>